Let me ask you this question. Have you ever lost a dear friend and then thought back to fond memories you had with them over the years? You think back to the good times, the times you spent talking up late at night, the times you spent going fishing or going on bike rides or spending time talking at a restaurant, the family get-togethers, the times out on the town, and you miss them. And you think to yourself, how could I do uh, something special for that person today, even though I don't even know them anymore? Maybe they passed away. Many of us have lost friends over the years, and sometimes something we'll do is we'll care for the loved ones of that friend because they meant so much to us. You know, that isn't true as well for King David, who lost a dear friend many years ago at this point in his life. Do you remember David's best friend? His name was Jonathan. He was one of the sons of his, his worst enemy, Saul. And yet, David loved Jonathan as a dear friend, as a brother. He was very, very close with Jonathan. He was a brother, closer than, than many other relationships, like a, like a best friend, a brother. And he lost him. And of course, he was heartbroken. Many of us, I'm sure, have had close friends over our lives, and it may, it, it, it may not even be that they're dead, it's just that we lost touch, or they moved away, or we had a fight. And you always look back with nostalgia on those memories, don't you? You look back and think to yourself, those were good times. And sometimes we're, we're wearing rose-colored glasses a little bit, but honestly, those are good memories, aren't they? They're, they're special times. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you. We pray, God, that you would minister to us through this touching moment in David's life. And I yield to your leading, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is in 2 Samuel chapter 9, and we see David thinking about Jonathan. He's in his throne room, he's king of the nation, and he's thinking about Jonathan and all Jonathan meant to him. If you remember in 2 Samuel 8, King David had gone on a sweeping military campaign in which he uh, defeated five enemy nations that surrounded Israel to the point that these nations were weakened. They were not totally defeated, but they were weakened. In fact, it had been a rather brutal campaign in which enemies were crushed and nations were overthrown in, in, in many cases. And it was bloody. But now David has rest. But now the energy of those battles dies down and it kind of calms down in the, in, 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 the, in the kingdom, in the throne room. And David begins thinking about Jonathan, his old friend. I remember I had a friend uh, a long time ago that I loved very dearly. His name was Greg. And we used to talk all the time on AOL Instant Messenger. I don't know if any of you know of AOL Instant Messenger, but back in the glory days, of the early internet when you had dial-up internet uh, and maybe just starting to get cable internet, uh, we would talk back and forth for hours on AOL Instant Messenger. And I remember his username was The Secession and my username was Revolution in a Box. And we would talk back and forth for hours and hours and we thought we were so smart, but we just, we had great times. And today he actually makes uh, electronic music for movie trailers in California, and I'm a pastor in Michigan, so it's kind of interesting where we both ended up. We would hang out a great deal when we were in our 20s. I think uh, he may have just been using me for my car at the time, but I loved him. I don't know if he loved me as much as I loved him, but I, I deeply cared about Greg. As, he was a close friend of mine, and, and uh, we used to make music together. We used to make electronic music together. He would play guitar, I would sing. Uh, and we would just spend hours and hours talking, and we would go on adventures around town. We'd go to different cities and stay in hotels and just experience things in those towns. Uh, we'd look for beauty around the city, and we'd find those places and just sit and talk at, like on the side of a river or off a cliff, and we'd just sit there and talk all night into the morning. And those were great memories. I'm sure you have friends over your lives where you have those kind of memories of, of get-togethers and adventures and parties and, and family time and talking late into the night and t you know talking about everything and it's just so precious to you, I'm sure. For me as well, those memories were so touching. 
But over the years, Greg and I and many other friends that I had lost touch and we moved on with our lives. And it's like years later, it's like you never even knew that person. It's just crazy, but the memories are so precious. And David had lost Jonathan and he had died actually in battle. And it says in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, David's in his throne room and he asks, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? So if you recall, King Saul was his enemy and his enemy's son was Jonathan and he was close friends with Jonathan. Point number one today is find ways to show kindness to people around you. Very basic point, but it's still practical, I think. Most people you see in the world are struggling through life. I, I, I know people put up a good front in life, they really do. They, they make it appear like they're doing okay, but I will, I will stop and have conversations with people at the store, um, at restaurants, the waitress, the waiter, uh, pe people everywhere on the streets. And let me tell you, once you ask a few questions, you, the, the, the brokenness starts coming out. And, and the pain and the sorrows and the fears. And you, people put up a front, but they are hurting. And so I want to challenge you today to slow down and give someone some encouragement. Because people really do need it. They, she, she, she may look fine as she's ringing you up at the cash register. She's probably not. Uh, a lot of people are struggling. Pray for people. Encourage people. Show kindness just a little bit. Can can change someone's day, just a kind word, a smile, can really make a difference. So please do that. Most people I've found live lives of quiet desperation. They live lives of fear. So again, find ways to show kindness. Just like David, who looks for opportunity to show kindness to one of Jonathan's descendants. Someone who worked for Jonathan in the past is though still around in David's court. So they find him. It says in verses 2 and 3, Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Is there anyone around from, from Saul's family that I could bless? Point number two today. Notice what David says in verse 3. Or I'm sorry. Verse 3 says, The king asked, is there, is there no one alive from the, the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Point number 2. Notice what David says in verse 3. Notice that David says he wants to show God's kindness. I want to point you to God's kindness. Because it's not really just David who is showing kindness here. It's more deeply God who is using David to show kindness to this person. Similarly, friends, when you show kindness to someone, many a times God is leading you to do it. God is leading you to do it. And it's his will that you're living out in that moment. God is pouring out his love through you to another person. Do you get that? Amen. Be sure to be open to what God is doing. Slow down your day and realize someone might need encouragement from God through you in the room you're standing in. Okay? In verses 3 through 5, Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. Ah, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? the king asked. Ziba answered, He is at the house of Makur, son of Emil, in Lo Debar. Lo Debar was way north in Israel, up north in the mountainous areas. So the name of this son of Jonathan was. Meth oh no. <laughs> the name of this son of Jonathan was Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. Okay? Add that one to your baby name list. Mephibosheth. Okay? What a great name. But in any case. He, this guy, Mephibosheth, was briefly mentioned in 2 Samuel 4.4. 4, chapter 4, verse 4. And that scripture says, Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan's death came from Jezreel. His nurse picked him up and fled, but as she hurried to leave, he fell and became disabled. 
His name was Mephibosheth. Okay? Mephibosheth had this bad foot incident, and, and ever since he's been disabled. It was since he was five years old. He's been sort of an outcast in hiding this whole time. The nurse wanted to protect him from David uh, after Saul and Jonathan had died in battle, but instead in her hurry to escape, she dropped him and caused this disability. For years now, Mephibosheth has been cared for in a small town far north of Jerusalem in this little city of Lodabar. Now King David calls for him and brings him into the center of the kingdom, Jerusalem, the capital city, and into the courtroom of the king himself. Mephibosheth is brought into the king's courtroom and he bows down before the king. It says in verses 6 and 7, When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. So Mephibosheth comes in and bows down before David the king. And David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Point number three is I think we get a picture of the gospel right here, of Christ-like love. We each as human beings were born as part of the line of Adam. The first man who rebelled against his maker when he was deceived by the serpent. And so we all have been born as rebels against God. That's how I was born and raised up in the American system, in the world system, as a rebel against God, as one living in sin. Similarly, Mephibosheth is part of a house, a family that was an enemy of the true king, King David and his family. Yet, Mephibosheth is brought into the king's court and invited to sit at the king's table. Similarly, each of us, when we received Jesus Christ as our Savior, we were brought back into the family of God. We were transferred from the line of Adam to the line of Christ Jesus. We were brought from the rebellious line to the redeemed line. And though we had been enemies against God, we were invited to sit at the king's table with Jesus himself. And we even received an inheritance in the new kingdom to come, the new Jerusalem. Similarly, Mephibosheth receives all the land that used to belong to his descendant, Saul. So what Adam lost for us, which was our inheritance, we have regained in Christ. Just like Mephibosheth had lost his inheritance through Saul, and David gives it back to him. You see the gospel here. The gospel is hidden here, if you ask me. Think of yourself as Mephibosheth, broken, disabled, in hiding, part of a defeated family, left alone with very little. But David invites him in to sit at his table, at the table of the king, and eat with him and to be cared for by him. Similarly, that is what God does through Christ Jesus, our Savior. Isn't that amazing? We get invited to the table of the king when we become Christians, when we're born again. We escape the, the condemnation of Adam, of the line of Adam, of the line in, caught in sin. And we come into the line of Jesus Christ just to receive what was taken from us. We, we receive all and more. Because our sins deserve punishment, but there was one who stepped in to receive our punishment for us, Jesus Christ, one who stepped in to receive all that we deserved. Our sins were terrible. Sin is the scourge of our planet. It ruins everything, destroys everything. It reminds me of an episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And any Star Trek fans in the, in, in the room? One, two, oh my, not many. So I don't know if this is gonna make a lot of sense, but there were multiple Star Trek series, The Next Generation, the original series with James Kirk. Deep Space Nine was another one. This was the, there, there was this powerful empire, this evil empire in DS9 called the Dominion. And I recall an episode where one of these soldiers of the Dominion 
who were clones, had done something bad, started a fight with someone again after being told not to, and he goes to his boss soldier and he says, I, I disobeyed you again. I deserve punishment. I, I, I doesn't know. No, the Dominion. I deserve punishment, he says. And his boss says, and you shall have it, and he kills him right there. But he knows, he knows, I deserve punishment. I deserve punishment. And his boss says, you shall have it. And I've always remembered that, and I thought, you know, that was true for me. I knew I deserved punishment as a sinner. And yet Christ Jesus stepped in and said, I will take your punishment. So I've always remembered that moment and just, Jesus stepped in for me. And it's not that he just kind of threw them into the air somewhere. No, he paid the price. He suffered and died in full payment with his own blood for my sins. That's the gift. And it, take, it took a lot. It took a lot of blood of my Savior to cover my sins and your sins. So we should be so grateful that he did that for us. Because I knew I deserved punishment. And, you know, the enemy said, and you shall have it, you know, and I'm going to take you out. But God said, no, I'm going to step in and take that for you. Someone had to, though. Someone had to take that punishment. So I always remember that moment from Star Trek as, you know, a reminder of how Christ stepped in for me. Because I knew I deserved it. God finds us, and we know we deserve punishment, but God forgives us through Jesus Christ. For, Meph for Mephibosheth, here is how he responds to David's welcome. I was practicing that name Mephibosheth for hours, and now I can't do it right. I was practicing with Chelsea, and I was doing so good, and she couldn't get it right. No, I can't get it right, so I don't know what the issue is here, but okay. Maybe, God, maybe God's rebuking me, because I'm like, oh, I can do it. Chelsea can't. Now I'm getting, and I'm in trouble. Okay. Before Mephibosheth, here's what happens. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Mephibosheth is so lowly, so meek, so humble, he regards himself as nothing more than a dead dog. He saw himself as essentially already dead and lost, but David gave him a second chance at a life of meaning, a life of being in the court of the king. Next in verses 9 through 11, Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's old steward and servant, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. And Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. They're all going to go, go to work for Mephibosheth. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Ziba says, you bet, I'm on board. I will always serve Mephibosheth in this way. David also provides Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth with workers for the fields and servants to care for him. He has now land and a title and servants under him to provide for his needs and care for his land. Point number four, very simply, God will provide for your needs. God always does. Then in verses 12 and 13, Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table and he was lame in both feet. Lastly, point number five, Mephibosheth becomes an important man seated at the king's table like a son of the king himself, just like us in Christ Jesus adopted into the family. Hallelujah. Just like God adopted us and we get to call God as father. And Mephibosheth even has a son himself. Micah is his son. And in that way, he continues on the name of the house of Saul and of Jonathan. Despite the fact that he was lame in both feet, his story continued. Let that be a reminder to anyone with a d d disability or health issue. Your story isn't over with God. It's only just begun. No matter what your health problem or, or, or disability is, God is in your corner and he loves you. And your story isn't over with that issue. It's only just begun. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. He takes in the broken and makes them his children. 
and cares for their needs. That's who our God is. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the kindness that you showed Mephibosheth, God. Thank you. Through David. What a wonderful thing, Father. Help us to show that kindness to the people who need it. And help us to be amazed that you forgive our sins through the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.